Alhamdulillah, indeed our praise and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ghfiruh. So we praise Allah, we ask Allah for His help, and we seek Allah's forgiveness. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا And we seek refuge and protection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any evil, any sin, any mistakes that we make and any consequences that come as a result of those actions. وَمَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, absolutely no one can lead that person astray. وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْهُ فَلَا هَادِيَ And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to veer off of the path, no one but he, Jalla Jalaluhu, can bring that person back to the path. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِكَ لَهُ And I, Ismail, I stand before you, believing in the depth of my heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our creator, our sustainer, the only one worthy of worship. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ سَيِّدَنَا وَمَوْلَانَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنِنَا مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And I believe in the depth of my soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us He who is our example, our master, the comfort of our eyes Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ فِي كِتَابِهِ الْعَزِيزِ بَعْدَ أَنْ أَقُولَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ أما بعد So we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send our love and salams upon His beloved Ar-Rasul sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam And as was His sunnah, as was His practice every Friday you and I are gathered for Khutbah al-Jum'ah for this address on this beautiful and blessed day. And I was reflecting on um, the month that has passed us of this month of January, as is always is a good practice on Fridays to use the time to reflect about what has happened in the week, in the last two weeks, the last month. And someone pointed out to me that We've had some very interesting Wednesdays in the month of January. So Wednesday, January 6th, uh, it was insurrection at the Capitol. Wednesday, January 13th, was impeachment, or the second one, at least in the House of Representatives of uh, Donald Trump. Wednesday, January 20th, was the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States. And then Wednesday, January 27th, was investment. Right, so insurrection, impeachment, inauguration, investment. Four eyes throughout the month of January. All on Wednesday, subhanAllah. And if you don't know what I'm referring to on this past Wednesday, uh, some crazy things happened in the stock market. I don't uh, claim to be any expert in the stock market or financial, you know, sort of dealings. But the short answer is, the short uh, summary of what happened is that essentially, regular people, common people, some have experience, some maybe don't have as much experience when it comes to the stock market, shot the price of a stock up from, at the beginning of the day, $18 to over $350 which is ridiculous growth that would not normally happen on a regular given day. And many people said, okay, let's try to do this with other stocks. So the stock they did this with is called GameStop. Right? It's a famous store you can buy video games from um, throughout the city of Orlando has quite a few. So GameStop wasn't doing so well. You know, they, they lost a lot of money last year due to the pandemic. But regular people said, we're going to shoot this stock's price up and make a bunch of money off of it. And in the process, people who were big financial, you know, hedge fund managers lost essentially billions of dollars. I'm not going to go through all of how that works. It's not the point of the khutbah. 
Rather, people said, if we can do this with GameStop stock, let's try other stocks. Blackberry, Nokia, Bed Bath & Beyond. Trying to push the cost of the stock high based on the demand for the stock. Now, there's a lot of things you could take points to reflect on regarding the events in the stock market over the last two days. What I have taken from it, one of the points I've taken from it, is that I found myself, as someone who does not, if I'm honest, don't have, I have very little money in the stock market. I've tried, you know, here and there just to understand how it works. I was very much allured by the fact that, wow, I can put money into a stock maybe like Blackberry. Should I buy Blackberry today? So I bought, you know, two shares of Blackberry on Wednesday. Right? Very little, very little, because I'm not, I don't have the ability right now to just throw money into the stock market. But people were very much like, well, let's do this. I don't fully understand how the stock market works. I don't fully understand if it's even permissible Islamically for me to invest in the stock market. By the way, I'm not saying that it's haram, just be very clear, okay? But I don't know those parameters, but I have some feeling inside of me that says, well, I should try to take advantage of the opportunity. And in psychology and in the lingo of people nowadays, they call that FOMO, the fear of missing out. There's such a big opportunity here, I should just, I need to hop into it. I can't let it go. And it's not just Wednesday. I mean, if anybody here owns Tesla stock, you probably at some point had fear of missing out. It was what, $100 or so last year? Now it's over $800 in the price of the stock. If anybody has tried cryptocurrency, they own Bitcoin. I mean, there's some small coin called Dogecoin worth less than a cent shot up about a, a thousand percent yesterday because people said i'm just going to try this so it's very natural for human beings to when we see a business opportunity we see money that we naturally don't want to miss out on those things and it's not inherently a problem the question is, when we dive into something, do we really understand the implications of that thing? And this example of fear of missing out, I was reminded of the fact that there is an example in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of an incident in the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where the Sahaba, radhwanullahi alayhim, basically had FOMO. When the Prophet used to give khutbah in Medina, did you know that the khutbah used to be after the prayer? So you know for Eid, you pray first and then there's khutbah. The khutbah to Jumu'ah used to be the same way. You pray Salat al-Jumu'ah first and then khutbah after. But after this incident, the Prophet switched it. And the incident was, as it comes in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, the last ayah of Surah Al-Jumu'ah, that the, the Prophet finished the salah and he started giving the khutbah on the mimbar. And one of the caravans from Syria was on its way back to Medina. And the Sahaba knew that and the caravan is attributed to a man named Dihya. And so the caravan of Dihya comes into town while the Prophet is giving the khutbah. And they, whenever the caravan would come, they would play the tabla, they would hit the drums to let people know, hey, the caravan has come. Come to the market, come to the souk, get your goods, buy more goods, see what's happening. It was a big thing whenever the caravans would come. And so the Sahaba are in the Juma khutbah. And they hear the drums. And so, with all due respect to our beloved Sahaba, some of them feared that they would miss getting the food that was on the caravan. They feared that they would lose the opportunity of the caravan. And so they got up and left the khutbah. They got up and they left the khutbah. 
Allah says, when they saw the trade, the tijara, or they saw the vanity, they saw the alluring nature of the opportunity, they went towards it, and this is the part that gets me. Subhanallah. They left, it says, the ayah says, وَتَرَكُوكَ They left you, O Nabi, O Prophet, standing at the mimbar. Such that only 12 Sahaba are narrated to have been left sitting in the khutbah. And among the 12 are the 10 who were guaranteed paradise. Tarakuka qa'ima, they left the Prophet standing at the mimbar giving khutbah. Why? Because of trade. Because of the idea of an opportunity that they might miss. And so there's nothing inherently wrong with trade. Allah does not shun profit. We can have profit, we can have trade, we can have business. But we can't leave the Prophet ﷺ standing at the mimbar. We can't leave the Sharia aside. We can't consider, am I allowed to do this or am I not allowed to do this unless I fully understand what I'm getting myself into. And so it's a very natural human thing for us to fear missing out on something. But we have to be people who are disciplined and come to, I will only make a decision based on knowledge of what I'm getting myself into. And may Allah grant us that clarity in thought. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِوَلَكُمْ وَلِسَأِلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Qala Allah ta'ala, inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Amma ba'd. So there are a lot of lessons that one could take from the, you know, recent incidents related to the stock market and Again, I'm not a financial analyst, so I don't plan to stand in front of you and dissect all of the amazing things and lessons we could probably understand from this. But my simple point to myself was, I know the feeling that I felt when I heard of all these common people, you know, to use their terms, making this money in a day. If I bought 100 stocks at 18 bucks, a stock, $1,800 and that shoots up to $350 in one day well I've made more I, I can't have said to have made that money in a year let alone one day and I know the feeling I had inside of me when I saw that and I said well why, am I, why, why aren't I in the stock market why aren't I trading crypto why aren't I doing XYZ thing but we have to learn, should I do it or not? Do I follow the right parameters to do that? And underlying that idea is the idea that I need to do something to get my rizq from Allah. Yes, I have to put effort in for sure. I have to work, I have to do these things. But I cannot be looking for the next trick to just all of a sudden make me gain the world in that way. Allah tells the Sahaba in the same ayah, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ What is with Allah is better مِنَ اللَّهِ وَمِنَ tijara from any alluring idea or any sort of opportunity that may come in trade. You can't leave the Prophet standing at the door. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ and Allah is surely the best of any sort of person who can give to someone else. Mm. 
The last point that I'll make on this, if you'll allow me, you know, the way that one of the amazing things that happened with this scenario is that basically the regular people got back at the hedge fund folk, or at least this is the, the narrative, because those hedge fund folks were short selling the stocks, which basically means they're selling stock that they don't actually own. You can't, you can't sell a house if you don't own the house. You can't sell a car if you don't own the car. But legally, you can sell a stock if you don't own the stock. Which, by all scholars that I know, consider that haram. But the crazy part in my mind was, those hedge fund folks who are selling the stocks don't actually own the stock. But even I, if I validly own a stock, it's not really mine. Just like my clothes aren't really mine. My house is not really mine. My money is not really mine. It all belongs to Allah. Tabaraka alladhi bi yadihi al-mulk. Exalted is he who within his hands is the entirety of the dominion of the worlds. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir and he is in control of everything. We say these things like my money, my stock, my phone, my car. You are simply put in charge of those things. Even your own body. Those stock hedge fund folks were in charge of stock and they did something haram with it. You and I must take what we've been given by Allah and do things that are halal with it and benefit people because we don't really own it Allah can take it away whenever He wants so remember that Allah is the one who truly owns everything all you can do is make the right choice with who you, as the Prophet said, sell your soul to the Prophet said, we wake up every morning and we make a choice do I sell my soul to Allah or do I sell my soul to the world? And Allah says about the believers, "Inna Allah hashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum." Allah has purchased from the believers their souls and their wealth, which means we freely sell it to Allah, and that is the best financial transaction you could ever make. To give Allah your soul and Allah your wealth and you are the steward of those things in this life so when you return to him you will see that as they say return on your investment may Allah make us among those who see multiple returns on our investment Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa afina fi man afayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa barik lana fi ma a'atayt وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالحق ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت يا الله نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ونؤمن بك ونتوكل عليك اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم أدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار اللهم اجعل القرآن ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم انصر الإسلام وأعز المسلمين اللهم انصر المستضعفين والمظلومين في كل بلاد وكل مكان أرحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وأقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله